Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our fireside chat with Nextdoor. Uh, I'm Mike Boland, as David mentioned, um, analyst in residence, or I think they're calling me chief analyst now. I think I got a promotion today. That's nice. Um, with Street Fight, um, and we have a lot to talk about. Let's sit. Um, Hyperlocal, of course, is a perennial opportunity and a challenge as kind of a subsector of this um, kind of industry we all refer to as local. Um, and few people remember this, but Street Fight, when it started, was actually focused on, on hyperlocal. And of course, it's now expanded and is a more kind of holistic view of everything, all things local. Um, so before we get into some of the, the dynamics and, as I said, perennial challenges and opportunities of, of hyperlocal and Nextdoor's positioning within that, Prakash, uh, please tell us about yourself, your role, um, and then we'll dive into it. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Prakash. I am the co-founder and chief architect at Nextdoor. Um, my responsibility is basically to keep the site up and running, uh, build the infrastructure that we need as we grow and scale. Uh, prior to founding Nextdoor, I was at Google, where I ran uh, engineering for Google Maps. And I've been working in consumer internet for, God, saying this out loud sounds weird, but, but over 20 years. So uh, it's been a long time. So I think um, a lot of people are familiar with Nextdoor, especially this crowd. Um, but for those unfamiliar, let's, before we kind of dive into some of the dynamics, um, Nextdoor's positioning, or I guess the, from a product perspective, tell us a little bit about the current state of the user experience, and then we'll sure. go deeper. Uh, so for those who don't know, Nextdoor is a trusted communications platform for your local community. Uh, we have apps both on the mobile side and on desktop web. Uh, and the idea is you can come in, sign up with your email address and your physical address, and we'll drop you into a geographically bounded neighborhood community with other members who have verified that they live at the addresses within that neighborhood community. So uh, it's a great way to stay abreast of what's going on in your neighborhood, uh, to find, to reunite with a lost pet, to buy and sell or trade things with your neighbors, uh, and also to stay abreast of crime and safety issues, a rash of break-ins, um, stolen bikes. And most recently, we've also seen a lot of activity around, um, certainly down here with the Ventura fires, up in uh, Northern California with the Napa fires, and then down in Houston with uh, Hurricane Harvey. A lot of folks banding together during times of need uh, as a result of natural disasters. So it's a network that's really oriented around your location uh, and really utility driven. Sure. So a few other stats just for sake of context before we dive deeper. You currently have 185 neighborhoods globally. 185,000. Um, 185,000. Yeah. Um, that's a little bit more than 185. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Um, sorry, sorry, I downgraded you there. Um, so, and roughly 100% year-over-year growth in audience size. You're in 85% of U.S. neighborhoods. That's right. Um, demographic, interestingly, is 60% female with $100,000, $100, not $100, or more in household income. Um, and then you're also in, now in Germany, Netherlands, and U.K., partly through acquisition. Um, you've raised $210 million to date um, and have a current valuation of... 1.1 billion, which makes you one of the few local unicorns. So congratulations. Yeah, we, we don't love that word, unicorn, <laughs> yeah. but, but... I don't either. We'll, we'll take it. I don't, we'll I take don't either. It. Um, so let's go a little bit deeper. So one of the things that always strikes me about Nextdoor is the success it's seeing in the kind of hyper-local graveyard, for lack of a better term. And one of the challenges is the geographic fragmentation. You have zip codes, you have, you know, sub -zip, on the sub-zip code level, so many different nuances from one community to the next. So what is the challenge or how do you differentiate in tackling that with a consistent UX and quality standards and all the things you're building in these very kind of just nuanced and again fragmented uh, little kind of experiences? Yeah, I think, I think you hit the point right on the, ne the, the head. Nextdoor is an unusual product, unlike a Facebook or a Twitter or a LinkedIn. Um, we aren't able to create kind of this global network effect. We have thousands and thousands, 185,000 micro-communities. And so when we started the company, as we sort of observed uh, what you call the graveyard of local, um, the road was littered with corpses of companies that had tried to do this before. Our, our idea was not necessarily novel in trying to connect people in the local community. But I think we discovered two things uh, early on that were really, really important. The first was creating a real sense of identity for these communities, just like any online community, and our background was an online community, um, it needs a strong identity for people to bind to. And so we felt like that identity was the neighborhood, and the way to really reflect that identity was to, to do the hard work of actually defining neighborhoods geographically 
and binding people into those neighborhoods, which is the second point, through trust by verifying that they were residents of the community. Because essentially, we, we saw um, a statistic that was pretty surprising to me, and, and maybe some of you have seen this, but in the summer of 2010, when we started to work on this, the Pew Research Institute had released a stat that said 29% of Americans knew very few of their neighbors, while 28% didn't know a single neighbor by name. And so, you know, that, that for us was almost an existential threat to, to creating this product. We, we had to think to ourselves, how are we actually going to grow this? And over time, what we developed was a, a very scientific playbook around growth, which really was about going out through various strategies, including boots on the ground, offline marketing, really unscalable stuff, particularly in the first year, to get those neighborhoods seated, to get those neighborhood boundaries drawn by the community members who are starting these communities, and then a, a set of strategies to actually get those up to scale. Once we got them to scale and we had liquidity of content, the next challenge was sort of emerging out of this very single neighborhood-centric experience that we had built and creating some bleed across communities. And that's when we introduced features like nearby neighborhoods, which are neighborhoods that are adjacent to you. It allows you to share and, and spread content between those communities. And then we started to do government agency partnerships. And these are partnerships with local law enforcement, municipal agencies like the Department of, Energy, or of uh, Emergency Management, where they could publish content in to a much broader set of communities, and then you could have shared conversations across those. So we, we innovated a few different things in this area, but that's kind of how we, we started to bleed and grow. So we talked about this last day, uh, backstage, excuse me. So, and you just mentioned neighborhood boundaries. Um, I think it's an important point that one of your success factors is how you de determine what makes a certain kind of next door community um, one from the next, because of course there's a trade-off of you want to have an amount of robust activity and network effect, but also not too large where you still get that community feel. Yep. I think what you do is you let the community decide. So how does that look? Yeah, so if you come in and sign up for Nextdoor and you put in your address and a neighborhood does not exist at your address yet, you have the opportunity to become a founding member of the neighborhood. And part of your responsibility is to go in, draw a neighborhood boundary, and then recruit 10 additional members to join. It's almost a game mechanic or a, a, a tacit endorsement that the neighborhood boundary that you've drawn is actually correct. So that's how the neighborhood boundaries come about. Now, flipping back to you know, what, what maybe caused some of these other efforts to fail in the past, that neighborhood boundary actually ends up being really important. It's a pain to, to sort of get up and running with that, and you want all of these boundaries to sort of interlock like a jigsaw puzzle across the entire, entire country. So there's a lot of disputes about boundaries and things over time. But really, that creates that fundamental piece of identity that then users bind to. So um, users do create these neighborhood boundaries. And uh, over time, you know, they've, they've started to kind of understand uh, a little more why the parlance in our community structure is different than, you know, maybe what they might talk about in the real world. So I live in Pacific Heights in San Francisco. But my next door community is much smaller than that because Pacific Heights probably has 30,000 residents and my next door community has 1,000 and that makes it a little bit more approachable and a little bit, a little bit more intimate in terms of being able to have some conversations. Is there, is there gerrymandering within the, the neighborhood boundaries? Yeah, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, kidding, I wouldn't exactly call it gerrymandering <laughs> but I think there, there are definitely issues that, that come up uh, within these communities about the, the boundaries. So what kind of trending are you seeing in terms of the, the types of features that are used or the types of things that resonates or the types of conversations that are happening, whether they segment geographically or rural versus urban, or are there any kind of trending that informs how you then start to monetize? And we'll go into monetization next. Yep. So it's actually, it's remarkably surprising, but across all neighborhoods in the, in not just in the US, but internationally, um, there's a lot of consistency around what people are talking about. A lot of people come to find out about Nextdoor, interestingly enough, um, through crime and safety issues in their neighborhoods or through disaster efforts. So something's gone wrong, people say, oh, get on Nextdoor because that's where all the information is. So that's, that's kind of an onboarding mechanism where people hear about us. But the biggest category in which people are conversing is around recommendations and sharing recommendations for local service providers or local businesses with one another. So someone will put out a message saying, hey, I'm looking for a babysitter or an auto mechanic or a plumber, and their neighbors will respond with service providers who they've used and endorse. And so we think that that's a really, really interesting resource vis-a-vis um, -vis some of the other you know, players in this space. 
where you've got people who actually are verified users of the neighborhood recommending local businesses in the neighborhood. And we think that's a really nice synergy. Well, that's the most powerful form of local marketing is word of mouth, so you're yep. kind of bottling that. Um, so one of the other kind of longstanding challenges in hyperlocal is monetization. Um, and you guys have a pretty specific monetization plan, which of course is evolving. Right now you're doing real estate, uh, real estate ads, real estate listings, ads, and sponsorships. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? Sure. So our first foray into monetization, we're about, I don't know, something like 18 months or so into this experiment, but um, is, is a product called Sponsored Posts. And similar to what you see on Facebook or Twitter, uh, it's a native advertising unit that appears in our newsfeed. And this is a conversational unit, so it can contain media, photos, um, it can contain text, and people can, can actually have conversations about these products. So, for example, if the Ring doorbell is advertising on our platform, they can have a little interactive unit that shows up in the newsfeed, and people can discuss their experience with the Ring doorbell. So it's almost uh, a way of kind of aggregating endorsement from the local, local communities as well. The second um, monetization product that we've, we've rolled out, and I think we're now in 12 uh, different locations in the US is uh, a product for realtors. And so what's really interesting about the, the real estate product is that we have a section now on Nextdoor where you can see local real estate listings. And it's, it's very organic. It's like content to our users. So it's really engaging content for them to see. But we allow realtors to come in and sponsor that listing section. And it's really nice because if you, if you compare that to the way that, that realtors are getting the word out about their services today, well, probably all of you have received a postcard from your local realtor showing all the recent home sales in the area with a little picture of them saying like, hey, when you're ready to sell your house, you know, come, come holler at me. And so we're, we're, we think this is a much more, uh, you know, less intrusive way of doing that. So real estate makes sense, uh, one, because it is organic to the experience. There, there's a lot of discussion around real estate in, in neighborhoods. Uh, but two, I think that real estate is a vertical where the buyer, the demand side, in, in advertising terms, um, has less price elasticity. Their kind of ROI equation is big ticket items, high Absolutely. margin, low volume. So that seems to make sense. Are there other categories that represent ones you could move into that kind of hit those marks of being organic, being a receptive buyer, or any other factors? Yeah, I, you know, without getting into specific roadmap yep. items, things that we think about that I think are natural extensions of our platform that lend to monetization. We talked about 35% of all conversations on the platform being about neighbors recommending businesses to one another. Well, we think that there's a natural synergy there with the community of local businesses to be able to kind of put that together and have them be part of those conversations. So that's certainly one. Um, another idea around the vertical uh, kind of category are things like deals and coupons, which again, lend themselves as content really to users. There's a lot of, lot of value to that for our, for our members and I think our members would enjoy that. And then that drives visitation to these local businesses as well. So I think off the top of my head, a couple of, couple of examples of things that we think about um, you know, that, that seem pretty natural extensions of our platform. Home service would seem like a natural extension along the lines that you discussed. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Again, I think any of these services uh, that are available in your local community that people are already talking about on Nextdoor, um, it seems like we should give people in the local business community an opportunity to be part of those conversations. So let's pan back to kind of the macro environment. A lot happening. There's like in the age of fake news, there's kind of a a backlash and everyone's kind of guard is up in terms of pointing at things or spending time around things that are more genuine or validated. Are you finding that trend generally causing people to kind of turn back to their communities for sources of news or interaction? And, and before you answer, I think one kind of thing that happened recently that really just kind of, I don't know, personifies all that is Facebook um, announcing they're kind of deranking publishers and news sources um, but more recently, actually earlier this week, kind of followed up that by saying they are upranking local news, um, news that is less divisive, news that is more about your communities. Along that overall kind of thing, what they're trying to do is give people more of a kind of meaningful exchange on Facebook. So all of that together, do, do, are you also seeing that in terms of people turning to their communities in this kind of age of, you know, topsy-turvy yeah. trustworthiness? What, what I think here is um, there is still a continual thirst for local information, local news. And in the publishing world, local newspapers, local journalism has been dying 
because of business model failures. And so I think there's this, uh, this impedance between the demand for local information and the availability of local information. Now, I don't think that we drop in and replace local journalism, for example. And what Facebook's doing, I think mostly in their local efforts, is really around you know, bringing up uh, local events, uh, aggregating information about published local news. What we're doing is a little bit different, and I think context really matters here. And so we talked about this a little, a little behind the scenes, but um, the context on Facebook is that you're interacting with people who you know, who you have a relationship with. And on Nextdoor, we talked about that Pew Research Institute study. You don't actually necessarily know people in the same way. You don't have relationships with them. You're bound by the context in which you live. And so the conversations on Nextdoor tend to orient around really utility-driven types of topics and a lot less about things like political ideology or world affairs. In fact, our community guidelines suggest that Nextdoor isn't necessarily the best place to come talk about what's going on in national politics. That's, that's a decision that we ultimately we do want to make Nextdoor a place where people can talk about what's going on locally in yeah. local politics and things, but that's not something that we see a lot of today. So to answer your question about given all of the things that are going on on Facebook around the shift from publishers to uh, users on the news feed, the up, up ranking of local, we think of Facebook as going from kind of this global context to trying to go to more of a local context through the use of publicly available local information. On Nextdoor, we are generating interest based on what mem members want to talk about. So our members are putting out conversations that they think are relevant and locally important, yep. and they're engaging their other, their other neighbors to, to participate. So I think it's, it's fundamentally different. And, and let's stay on Facebook, because I think that, um, you know, we've been asking this question for years if Facebook is kind of a sleeping giant in local. So for example, um, w within local search, when Facebook started to get into graph search and things like that, people were asking this question. Um, and my answer has always been that they're almost too horizontal um, in things like local search and the ex extensivity of it, um, people don't consider Facebook, at least now, they could change that persona, but at least now, don't consider it a place to go and find you know, a plumber, speaking of home services, or, or other yeah. kind of verticals. Um, and that makes it almost too horizontal. Uh, probably a better example is something like LinkedIn. LinkedIn succeeds because it has that spe spe specialty, unique focus, um, so you guys are kind of analogous to that in terms of having a specific focus on neighborhood interactions as opposed to things that just kind of get lost in the sea of the news feed. Right. Yeah, I think that that is, you know, that is the context, right? The right. context matters. Who, who is the audience that you're speaking with? What is important to that audience? What kinds of interactions are best facilitated by that audience? And so on Nextdoor, when you put out a message saying, hey, I'm looking for a babysitter, there's local context to the audience that you're reaching out to, so you know that it's going to be someone that lives close by. Um, there is context around being trusted as part of the neighborhood, so you know that you're not going to get an answer from a troll or from somebody that you know, could potentially be dangerous or harmful. Uh, so I think the context really is everything in that. And uh, similar to how LinkedIn was able to sort of create their own context around a professional network uh, that was distinct from Facebook, I mean, imagine the the user experience, really, on Facebook, blending together pictures of you uh, partying in Cancun with some professional post of you trying to recruit somebody uh, to your job or, or a post from your venture capitalist uh, talking about some new investment that they've made, right? It's, it's just unusual and it doesn't work, so. Context, I think, is the, is the right point. Now, yeah. staying on Facebook and also bringing in Google, I want to ask you about two products that start to get to a neighborhood level, which both have l launched recently. And the first one is Facebook's Today In, which is mostly kind of a, I don't know, a transition of what they had with events. But it's, right. you know, yeah. within the main app, it's Today In to see local, local stuff. Um, and then Google Bulletin more recently came out. Um, and that's Google's attempt to kind of crowdsource some of the local news. Uh, what do you think about both of those products and how they come into or don't come into some of the things you guys are doing? Yeah, it's certainly interesting to us, right? We, we watch these products with great interest. Uh, I think, again, it speaks to that demand for more local information that, you know, this vacuum has emerged where local journalism uh, has not been able to sustain, I think, the distribution that it needs. And so everyone's trying something a little bit different. Um, 
again, I think even in the case of Google and Facebook, and as someone who used to work at Google, Google has, has had a lot of challenges with community-driven products, whether it's Google Plus or even some of the, the early efforts that we had on Maps trying to crowdsource information. Um, I think our specialization is connecting people in this local context for user-generated, member-generated stories and content. I think there is a place where potentially we might be able to work, work together with companies like Facebook and Google uh, as a distribution platform for different kinds of news. I think that would be interesting. Um, we don't view it as necessarily an existential threat. Um, there are lots of things that we do view as existential threats and that, that Google and Facebook could be doing. Um, but these, I think, feel much more like complementary efforts. Yeah. So. Makes sense. So we are out of time, but I want to give you the chance to have a final word, a quick answer on what are your goals for 2018? What are you excited about? What can we expect out of Nextdoor in 2018? Yeah, we're really excited, obviously, about um, some of the things that we're doing on the monetization front. But I think the thing that we're most excited about is a new product um, that we've launched around recommendations. And we call it Neighborhood Favorites. And it's a, 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 a cultivated list by members of the very best businesses in their local community. And this is uh, something that we launched uh, a few months ago. We already have something like 17 million uh, recommendations across the country. And so this can be a resource to people all over the world as they come into different areas in the country about what the best businesses are, categorized, full taxonomy. And so that's something we're really interested, uh, really, really excited about. And also, um, there's a lot more that we're doing in terms of engagement and new features, uh, orienting people around their interests and trying to combine them uh, in ways that drive kind of deeper engagement and more authentic engagement. So uh, those are a couple of things that we're nice. pretty excited about. Will you be available for questions offline for anyone that wants to talk to yeah, you? Yeah, I'm here for a little bit. Yes, Great. Absolutely. Please join me in thanking Prakash.